welcome to Mauna Lua Past, Present, and Future. My name is Luca Nicole Savas, and today we will be talking about the Hawaiian honey creepers. These magnificent birds were once found in the forests of Mauna Lua, but unfortunately they have started to disappear from the islands of Oahu and also across the Hawaiian Islands. The remaining honey creepers are on the precipice of extinction, but there is hope. My guest today is Josh Atwood. He is the Information and Education Coordinator for, the forest and, for Forestry and Wildlife, a division in the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. He works to connect people with the plants and animals and the environment of Hawaii and increase understanding of what we can do to help our natural resources from threats. He works statewide but is based on Oahu and he actually lives in Mauna Lua. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I'm always happy to talk about Hawaii's native birds. So, so today we're going to be talking about the plight of the Hawaiian honey creepers and the conservation tools that is going to be used to save them from extinction. Yes. All right. So first question, what's a Hawaiian honey creeper? So a honey creeper is a, a type of bird. And so if you've heard of a finch, uh, these are uh, part of the finch family and honey creepers actually uh, in Hawaii are very unique and so they are descended from an ancestor that got to Hawaii probably five to seven million years ago. Uh, something that was finch-like but once it arrived in Hawaii it found these new habitats and once it started you know living in all these different types of environments over time, those birds changed, and so we have something we call adaptive radiation. So mm -hmm. from those uh, ancestors that first arrived in Hawaii, we have um, this kind of blossoming of different species that uh, turned into over 50 different types of honey creepers in Hawaii. So the, the ones that people are probably most familiar with mm -hmm. are birds like Eevee, uh, maybe our friends on Maui might be familiar with the Kiwi Q or on Hawaii Island, uh, the Palila. Um, so there's different types of honey creepers on the different islands. Uh, and so it really depends where you are in the state, uh, what you might be familiar with. The really uh, special thing about these birds is that they're found nowhere else mm -hmm. because as I said, uh, they arrived here and then kind of evolved in Hawaii. Um, that's a long process. When the ancestor for these birds got to Hawaii, at that time, Kauai and Niihau were just forming. And so the other islands uh, weren't even part of the Hawaiian island chain yet. So we're really talking about a huge amount of time where these birds are thriving in Hawaii's forests on their own, getting adapted into different environments, uh, and being a really big part of Hawaii's wildlife. Fast forward to nowadays, you know, there's a lot of different uh, threats and so from those 55 something species, we have about 17 species that are left. Uh, we've lost a lot to various um, reasons that I think we'll talk about yeah. later today. So that was my next question of there's only 17 left from the 55 different or 50 plus species that we once had. What happened to them? Why did they disappear? Well, like a lot of our native species in Hawaii, you know, they evolved here before uh, people showed up. And so the Hawaiian Islands uh, as a whole, there was a period of about 70 million years where the islands are forming from the volcanic hotspot. Uh, things are arriving from around the world and often evolving in place just like the honey creepers did. And um, there weren't any people, uh, and there weren't any mammalian predators. The only native mammal we have here, of course, is the Hawaiian bat, <laughs> um, on land anyway. And um, so you end up with these life forms that are really specifically um, well suited to that kind of environment. And then when humans show up, uh, we're really good at bringing our favorite associated species with us wherever we go. And so we change things really quickly um, compared to, you know, the 70 million years that these birds are on their own uh, in Hawaii, or sorry, the 70 million years that the islands are on their own, the five to seven million years that these honey creepers are on their own. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you've got um, people showing up and they bring with them, um, you know, other species. So 
with the uh, Polynesian explorers. There's about 30-some uh, species of canoe plants and animals that came with them. Uh, and then, of course, when we have European contacts, mm -hmm. that's when a lot of things get introduced that become very widespread in Hawaii that are unlike anything these birds and other native species in Hawaii have had to deal with. So pigs, goats, sheep. Uh, and so the habitat really changes, and the species that these birds rely on uh, really change. Um, we have a lot more invasive plants in the forest, so um, plants that some of our native birds might have co-evolved with um, and relied on as a food source, and the plants in turn uh, rely on the birds. You know, those relationships get disrupted as we have more invasive species, habitat loss, and then um, predation, you know, things like rats, uh, feral cats, um, and mongoose can be real threats to our native birds. So all those pressures cause our birds to uh, really decrease quickly in terms of population size. But of course, the, the biggest threat, I think, is one we're gonna talk about today a little bit, uh, which is actually um, disease. Okay. And so one of the worst invasive species that I think most of our viewers have probably had the uh, misfortune to deal with is the mosquito. Um, there was a time uh, not that long ago when Hawaii was mosquito free. And in the 1820s, uh, mosquitoes were probably accidentally introduced. Um, and with them, they brought the types of diseases that mosquitoes can carry. And one of those is uh, really deadly to our native forest birds. So, um, I'm going to turn it back to you if you don't right. mind because, you know, we work together uh, on some conservation partnerships and so, you know, while I thank you for having me here, I think you're also, you know, an expert in this that I want to uh, ask some questions of. So yeah. maybe you can explain um, to our audience kind of why mosquitoes and the diseases they carry are such a primary threat uh, to these birds. Yeah, so thanks, Josh. Like you were saying that these birds evolved in these islands isolated. You know, they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So there was no disease here prior to the introduction of the mosquitoes. So our native honey creepers just don't have a natural immunity or a re disease response, immunity response to like avian malaria or avian pox that came with the introduction of not only mosquitoes, but the introduction of non-native songbird species. So we have a couple of pictures that we want to show where we have a house finch. And you see this is a non-native species. And if it does get bit by a mosquito that has avian malaria, there's basically a 0% chance that it's going to die. It, its immune response knows how to fight the disease within itself. Um, the next one, we see a couple of our more native birds. Um, next picture, please. Thank you. We have the Hawaii Amakihi and the Apapane, and they're at 65% and 63%, which still seems not so, it's pretty bad, even though it's like a little bit higher than 50%. And then finally, on the last one, we have the Maui Alawahio, which is 75%, and our, you know, iconic EEV is 90% mortality rate. So a lot of our native, native species, or at least our native honey creepers, one bite from an infective mosquito basically means death. You know, I used to work more specifically in the field of invasive species in Hawaii. And this is really indicative of a, a broader concept where species that evolve in island habitats tend to not have defenses against um, mm -hmm. predators or even herbivores. And so that's how you get things in Hawaii like uh, mint plants that don't produce a mint compound because they don't have to worry about herbivores browsing them. And so, yeah, for our native honey creepers, it's, you know, from their perspective, why would they need to have immunity or defenses against these diseases that didn't exist for the millions of years that this was their home? I see. Uh, and so something, you know, changed very rapidly for them. Um, really sad story, but something we see time and time again across different groups of uh, native species impacted by invasive species in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So given that, can we see any remaining Hawaiian honey creepers? Yes, so as I mentioned, there's 17 species remaining uh, from our honey creeper family. And 
as I mentioned earlier, they are, there's different birds on different islands. So we have some pictures we're going to put up on the screen uh, so the folks at home can see the birds that we're talking about because unfortunately they're really hard to see uh, in real life. But this is the Akakiki. This is one of the birds found on Kauai. Uh, one of the, the rarest birds in uh, Hawaii at this point. I hear there's only 45 of them left out in the wild. That's our best estimate, and it's really hard to tell at this point. Um, you know, things, when you get down to that small of a population, um, things tend to be kind of highly variable. You know, if there's a group of these birds that lives in one area and they get impacted by a storm event, you know, you're potentially looking at the loss of a huge percentage of the population just mm -hmm. from one uh, damage incident. So, yeah, currently we think it's, you know, somewhere in the double digits. Oh, and, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's, uh, it's really concerning and it's something that uh, is hard for conservationists and bird lovers to, to swallow. But okay. that's the reality we have at the moment. Um, this is another bird species that we have on Kauai, the Akake'e. And so this is another uh, critically endangered forest bird. Uh, it has numbers that are slightly higher than the Akakiki, but it's still, um, you know, we've done studies that I think we're gonna talk about a little bit later, kind of projecting out how if things don't change, this is probably one of the species that we might lose uh, in the near future. Oh. So joining them on Kauai uh, is the Iivi. Uh, so this bird exists on multiple islands in Hawaii. As you said, it's very iconic. It's known for that curved beak I mentioned earlier, uh, co-evolving with plants. And so this is a classic example of a honeycreeper that co-evolved with plants in Hawaii like our lobeliads, which have the same exact curve. And so those species uh, go together. And that's where the EEV gets uh, some of its nectar. Uh, the next bird that we have on Kauai is the Apapane. So this is another bird that uh, exists on multiple islands, um, but you can see on Kauai. And then the next one is the Kauai Amakihi. And then lastly, the Anianiao. I think that's so, our next picture. Yeah, we have one more little yellow bird, the Anianiao. Well, when it comes up, I did <laughs> hear that it weighs as much as four pennies. Wow. Okay. So if it's like in the <laughs> palm of your hand, this tiny little bird. Yep. And I've never seen one in person. It's, you know, I've, I've worked for a long time with DLNR and these birds are so rare and in such um, sensitive habitats mm -hmm. that, you know, even those of us who spend all of our time talking about how to conserve these species, we don't necessarily get to go out and, and see them because um, we're trying to keep their habitat as undisturbed as possible. So that's our current collection of uh, honeycreepers on Kauai. Uh, we have just a couple of photos that show the birds that are still in existence on Oahu. Uh, we should have a photo again of the Apapane. I don't know if we can yeah. pull that back up. That's number nine. Thank you. So um, there's only two compared to, you know, Kauai. We went through quite a few different species. On Oahu, it's just the Apapane, and then the next one is the Oahu Amakihi. So it looks like number 10. Okay, I don't think we have a, a photo of the Oahu wow. Amakihi, but it's mm -hmm. similar in form to the Kauai Amakihi. And those can still be seen uh, in the Ko'olau Mountains, but um, not in great numbers. And so if you do see one on Oahu, uh, you're very lucky. Uh, moving on to Maui, there's several honeycreeper species that still exist on Maui. Um, one of the rarest, uh, and I think most beautiful, is the A Koe Koe. Uh, just incredible plumage. And so this bird you can find um, around Haleakala. And unfortunately, this is another one of the critically endangered birds that we're potentially looking at extinction in the next five to 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, unless we can really change the dynamics around avian malaria. Uh, the next photo is of Kiwi Q, or uh, sometimes called the Maui parrotbill. And so this is another extremely rare species. Uh, lots of conservation work happening around this species, um, but unfortunately, avian malaria and the mosquitoes that carry it have been getting into um, kiwi Q habitat uh, mm -hmm. in ways that we had not expected previously. Um, some of the other birds on Maui, the Maui alawahio, the Iivi, of course, 
and the Hawaii Amakihi and Apapane. And then we're going to move over to Hawaii Island for our last collection of birds. And so on Hawaii Island, our honey creepers include the Akepa. Oh, so beautiful and orange. Yeah, really incredible colors. <laughs> uh, the Alavi and the Hawaii Amakihi. Uh, the next one is the Apapane. So again, you're seeing that this, this bird has actually done fairly well for itself. It's one of the, the least threatened honey creepers. Uh, the Palila, and then Eevee. And then our last species that we have a photo of is the Akia Pola Ao, which again, just great curved beak. That's one of the kind of classic things you learn about uh, when you're learning about evolution. And uh, the word I mentioned earlier, uh, or the phrase adaptive radiation, all those kind of beak shapes are a result of the different habitats and kind of different ways that these birds uh, interact with the world around them. Um, and so, you know, in addition to color, checking out the, the beak forms of all these birds is one way to just kind of appreciate uh, the diversity of birds that we have here. I see, so like what they were eating or how they were interacting with the plants and insects and stuff, and even each other. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I see. So, um, you know, these are the species that are still left in Hawaii, but even if you're watching this show uh, and you've been to these different islands, you probably haven't seen these birds. I have. Yeah, <laughs> um, and so it's really rare because, um, you know, I work for forestry and wildlife, and so much of the work we do is in Malco forests, and most of our population lives in residential communities that are at low elevations. Yep. And so unless you're, you know, backpacking at high elevation sites on the weekends and, you know, being really still and kind of looking through binoculars, most people haven't seen these birds at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was hoping you could kind of explain why these birds are no longer in the same communities that we humans are living in at low elevations. Yeah, so these birds actually used to be like Malco to Makai. You could see them in native forests from the sea from the beach, all the way tops of the mountains. But because of mosquitoes and avian malaria, they're restricted to the high elevations forests because mosquitoes and avian malaria need warmer tem temperatures to complete the life cycle. So they don't go into the high elevation forest. Unfortunately, as you have been alluding to, that's changing. The climate change and our, um, what is it called? The temperature, the regional temperature of our forests are starting to increase, so it's allowing these mosquitoes to go up higher and higher. And they're even being found year around in Kauai and Maui at densities and at times that they've never been seen before by those who go out into the field to take care of our birds. And so, like you had mentioned, um, the four birds, the Aki Kiki, the Ake Ke'e, the Akohe Kohe, and the Kiwi Q are all estimated to go extinct within the next five years. And there's even like sad stories that the Aki Kiki may even go extinct in the wild this year or next year, right? Mm -hmm. Unless things change. So, Unless things change. Yeah, we don't, um, it's a really incredibly sad story um, to kind of look at the populations of these birds and see how they decrease over time. But of course, there's still, you know, people out there who are really dedicated to preserving these birds uh, and we're using some different techniques to try to keep them from going extinct. Um, so, you know, before we get into some of the, the larger ideas that could really be game changers, some of the things we have been doing to protect these birds, um, one of the, the primary tools is captive rearing. Okay. And so you mentioned that Akakiki hopefully won't, but could go extinct in the wild. We've had that happen with other birds in Hawaii, like the alala, mm -hmm. the Hawaiian crow. And um, nobody, that's not anybody's preferred solution to take uh, native species off the landscape. But if it's a question of, you know, only a few individuals remaining, and if we leave them on the landscape, uh, the species goes extinct, versus we try to bring them into uh, a facility where we can care for them and try to help them uh, make progeny, 
then that's um, kind of the, the best solution we have at the moment. And so some of these birds are coming into captive rearing facilities where they're of course in a mosquito-free environment. They're kept away from rats and mongoose and cats and uh, they can, you know, make lots of babies. <laughs> and the idea is that when we can um, restore the habitat uh, that has been damaged by humans and their associated invasive species, we can return those birds um, back to the landscape. It's nobody's goal to keep birds in captivity uh, in the long term. And so we're hoping that that's a temporary solution while we work on uh, some of the larger landscape scale solutions that, that we have. Um, and so a big part of the other tools we use are really uh, habitat restoration through planting native plants. In some areas, we're putting out uh, predator-proof fences to create habitats where birds can be safe uh, even outside, but um, you know, rats and mongoose and cats can't get into their habitat area. Uh, and then in some situations, we might also use translocation, which okay. is uh, taking birds from one spot where there's a lot of uh, predators or habitat issues and taking them to another spot where those issues don't exist. Okay. Um, and so those are kind of our, our current tools. But we have some, some other tools that we're hoping will make a larger, more systemic change. Uh, to get the habitat back in order. And I know through our work with the Birds Not Mosquitoes Partnership that you're an expert in this. So oh. maybe you can kind of talk about yeah. uh, what's on the horizon. Yeah, I didn't know I would become a mosquito birth control expert <laughs> <laughs> in my field, but yeah. Um, mosquito birth control is also known as the incompatible insect technique. And it adopts a natural phenomenon that happens between the interaction of a bacteria and a mosquitoes. So um, if we could bring up the graphic, please. What you see on the TV is on the left side, there are two mosquitoes that have a compatible or the same type of bacteria. When they mate, they lay eggs, those eggs hatch, and you know the cycle completes itself. On the right side of the screen, you see two mosquitoes that have different incompatible bacteria. They mate, they lay eggs, but those eggs don't hatch, and that is that natural phenomenon that scientists, researchers, conservationists are bringing to Hawaii to suppress or decrease the mosquito populations in the birds' critical habitats. So, you know, everybody's familiar with the concept of bacteria. Bacteria is everywhere in our world and there's uh, different forms of it. Some bacteria we really like uh, and, you know, take bright probiotics to get more of in our lives. What is this bacteria that uh, kind of creates this difference in mosquito reproductive abilities? Yeah, so this bacteria has a really cool name, Wolbachia, and it is a naturally occurring bacteria that's found in almost half of all insect species, um, including some native and non-native species already here in Hawaii. It only infects um, invertebrates, so not vertebrates like dogs, birds, or even us. And so we are working really hard to identify which Wolbachia is incompatible with the Wolbachia that's already found in the mosquitoes that are present in Hawaii. Great. And, uh, you know, I'm assuming that this is something that's been used elsewhere around the world. Um, you know, mosquitoes are not a problem that's specific to Hawaii. So are other people using this? Yeah, so it has been used around the world to reduce mosquito populations you can see on the map. Um, all of these, though, are for human, trans human diseases like human malaria, dengue, chikuanga, and Zika virus. Um, there had been no reported an adverse health or environmental impacts from areas where this implementation has taken place. And we are the first that are adapting this for our birds for a conservation purpose. So, um, but to be, and to apply it on a landscape scale, we are going off into these rugged mountains of dense forests where a lot of these other places were like in the city or in the suburbs. So there's a lot of different techniques and technology that we have to adapt. But um, to reduce mosquito populations, we have to do it at a flooding. So we have to release a lot of mosquitoes, um, but only males. And as you know, but you know, I'm pretty sure everybody will be happy to hear, males don't bite and they don't transmit diseases. So we're not increasing the probability that when you go outside, you're gonna get bit by a mosquito. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think it's important to for people to know that there's different types of mosquitoes that do different things. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of the mosquitoes that have been used for this process around the world, like you said, those are for uh, reducing mosquitoes that bite by humans, but this is a particular type of mosquito that uh, tends to feed more on uh, birds and be a vector for avian malaria. Yeah. yeah. So we are coming close to time. So before we end, is there anything that the general public can do to help out or if any messages of why it's important to save these birds? Yeah, um, you know, I always like to say that um, one of the things people can do is just um, make a connection with our native species. And so while it may not be something that, um, you know, there's actions right now that individuals can take to help these birds that are, you know, in small numbers up in the um, Malco forests, just appreciating what makes them special and caring about what happens to these species is really important. And, you know, talk about them in your daily lives. Make sure you're tracking what's happening with our conservation projects. And um, there are opportunities to get involved in them, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to these efforts to um, use the incompatible insect technique or mosquito birth control uh, to save honey creepers. These are gonna be big projects where we have um, lots of community meetings and opportunities for dialogue and input uh, that gets incorporated into the decision-making process. You know, native birds, native forests are uh, a public resource that is really core to everyone in Hawaii. And so when we do a project like this, we're gonna be going into communities and asking people to share their thoughts on yeah, why are these birds important, and what do you, what are your thoughts about the the process that we want to use to try to keep them from going extinct? And you know, just to add, there um, we can go to www.birdsnotmosquitoes.org where you can learn more about the mosquito birth control. And then you touched upon all of the ecological relationships, but these birds also, you know were here when the Hawaiians first came, so they are culturally important too, as ancestors, as guardians, as communicators between the gods and the people. And so being able to save them will be able to perpetuate that into the future. And so I'd just like to end with saying mahalo nui loa to livable Hawaii kai hui and to uh, olelo and kai muki for opening up space for you know, us, birds not mosquitoes, to come and talk and just spread news about our honey creepers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.